This module will cover airfoils. Airfoils have no wingtips or engines or fuselage mounting intersections. They are simply a two-dimensional wing section. Flow over an airfoil is assumed to vary only with the X and Y directions. The Z direction would be out of the page. Thus, 2D airfoils are called infinite wings because the aerodynamic properties don't change along the span as they would for a three-dimensional finite wing. When airfoils are examined in a wind tunnel, the dimensions are constant along the entire span, and the span goes from one edge of the test section to the other. There's no wingtip for the air to spill over. Let's now walk through airfoil nomenclature. Leading edge, trailing edge, and thickness are pretty self-explanatory. The cord line is the straight line passing through the leading edge and trailing edges. The length of the cord line is called the cord. The mean camera line is the locus of points halfway between the upper and lower surfaces as measured perpendicular to the mean camera line itself. If the mean camber line is coincident with the cord line, the airfoil is symmetric. The camber is the distance between the mean camber line and the cord line measured perpendicular to the cord line. The maximum camber is the maximum distance between the mean camber line and the cord line and is expressed in terms of percent cord. When referring to airfoils, the maximum camber is often just referred to as simply camber. If the maximum camber line is positive as shown, the airfoil is said to have positive camber. If the camber is zero, in other words, the mean camber line is coincident with the cord line, the airfoil is symmetric. The geometric proportions of an airfoil section are conveniently expressed in terms of three main variables. First, the shape of the mean camber line. Second, the thickness. And third, the thickness distribution. A great number of airfoil sections have been developed over time. In order to provide a reliable basis for design, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, or NACA, developed a systematic series of sections in 1929 that show how changes in shape of the mean line and changes in thickness affect aerodynamic characteristics. Basing the series upon the assumption that thickness distribution is the least important variable, NACA chose the average thickness from the Clark Y airfoil in the U.S. and the Göttingen 398 airfoil from Germany as a basis for a major part of their early tests. By varying the percent thickness and shape of the mean camber line, but keeping the thickness distribution fixed, two series of airfoil sections were developed, the original four and five digit series. NACA came into being much like its successor organization, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, in response to the success of others. Even though the Wright brothers had been the first to make a powered airplane flight in 1903, by the end of World War I in 1914, the United States lagged behind Europe in airplane technology. In order to catch up, Cong Congress founded NACA on March 3, 1915, as an independent government agency reporting directly to the president. Unlike NASA, NACA began almost without anyone noticing. It started simply with a chairman, Brigadier General Scriven, a main committee of 12 members representing the government, military, and industry, and an executive committee with seven members chosen from the main committee, and one paid full-time employee whose name was John F. Victory. Committee members themselves were not paid and served only in an advisory capacity, meeting a few times a year to direct the aim of the new organization. Initially, the task of the committee was to coordinate efforts already underway across the nation. However, its mission and workforce soon grew to cover a greater role in aeronautics research in the United States. NACA 
NACA expanded their airfoil designations beyond the 4 and 5 series. We'll briefly walk through these, but you can review the original NACA documents for further information. At this level, we're just exposing you to the fact that there are multiple NACA series. The four-digit series is based upon a mean camber line defined by two second-degree parabolas that are tangent at the point of maximum camber. The code used to define the resultant contour of the airfoil is composed of four digits. The first gives the amount of maximum camber in percent of cord, 2% for this example. To make the math easy, we use a cord of one meter. The second digit gives the position of the maximum camber in tenths of a cord, four tenths for this example. And the last two digits give the maximum thickness in percent of the cord, 21% for this example. Note that a symmetric airfoil would have a maximum camber of zero, which makes the location of the maximum camber meaningless. Thus, the first two digits of a symmetric airfoil would both be zero. The five-digit series has the same thickness distribution as the four-digit series, but is based upon a mean camber line defined by a cubic in the forward part of the airfoil, which becomes tangent either to a straight line or to an inverted cubic that forms the aft portion. The first digit indicates the amount of camber in terms of the relative magnitude of the design lift coefficient. Now, we haven't defined lift coefficient yet, but we'll just consider it a design parameter at this point. The design lift coefficient will be 0.15 times the first digit. For this example, the first digit is 2. So 0.15 times 2 is 0.3. That would be the design lift coefficient. The second and third digits are divided by 2 to get the location of maximum camber in terms of percent cord. For this example, 30 divided by 2 gives a location of 15% of the cord. Finally, the fourth and fifth digits give us maximum thickness as percentage of cord. In this example, the maximum thickness is 12% of the cord. This group is defined as an airfoil having a minimum, or most negative, pressure occurring well back from the leading edge. Changes in airfoil characteristics within this series are then accomplished by changing the thickness and the shape of the mean line as in the four and five digit airfoils. The difference being that the airfoil is designed to give low drag at a particular angle of attack or lift coefficient. The second digit refers to the position of minimum pressure for the basic symmetric section of zero lift in tenths of a cord. The last two digits refer to the maximum thickness in percent of the cord. The six series airfoil is similar to that of the one series airfoil, but additional information is given by another number that shows the range of lift coefficients in tenths above and below the design lift coefficient for which a favorable pressure gradient exists on both surfaces. The seven series airfoils were designed to produce a minimum pressure at different percent cord of the upper and lower surfaces. Supersonic flight poses problems that are entirely different from subsonic. The series of airfoils based on theoretical considerations was developed by NACA. All airfoils are characterized by a knife edge leading edge. Again, the goal of walking you through the various NACA series was to expose you to the fact that there are multiple series. There are plenty of subject matter experts out there on airfoils. You, as the aerospace or flight test engineer, 
just need to be able to interact with these experts and understand their jargon. Before we define lift and drag coefficients, let's break down the forces and moments of an airfoil. Angle of attack is the angle between the relative wind and the cord line. While this definition makes sense for a symmetric airfoil, students often get confused with highly cambered airfoils. The cord line is the key reference for angle of attack, not the camber line. Lift is perpendicular to the relative wind, not the cord line. Drag is parallel to the relative wind, not the cord line. Moments causing the airplane nose to go up are defined to be positive. Take care when drawing free body diagrams and recall basic rigid body dynamics. While technically resultant force vectors can slide along the free body diagram, Without impacting translational motion, the actual location of the force vector impacts the moment or rotational analysis. Knowing the magnitude, location, and direction of the resultant force vector, we can calculate the moment about any point on the rigid body. For example, maybe we want a moment about the leaning edge of the airfoil, or maybe we want the moment about the trailing edge of the airfoil. For a given angle of attack and velocity, there is one location called the center of pressure where the moments about that point are zero. The center of pressure, however, is not a very convenient reference point in that a change in either angle of attack or velocity will cause the center of pressure to shift on the airfoil. It's not a fixed location. There is one point on the airfoil called the aerodynamic center where the moment about that point is independent of angle of attack. It doesn't necessarily mean the moment is zero, it just means it's basically constant. The moment will be positive for positively cambered airfoils. The moment will be negative for negatively cambered airfoils and the moment will be zero for symmetric airfoils. Unlike center of pressure, the aerodynamic center location is relatively fixed, which makes it a convenient reference point. In subsonic flight, the aerodynamic center is approximately one quarter cord. For supersonic flight, the aerodynamic center shifts back to approximately half cord. Piper Aircraft uses symmetric airfoils for the all-moving horizontal tail, which is called a stabilator, and mounts the pivot point at the aerodynamic center. This means the horizontal tail can freely pivot or change the angle of attack, and no restoring moments will be required or felt by the pilot. At first take, this sounds desirable. The pilot can move the horizontal tail at will with zero force. However, this also means the pilot can change the normal load factor or g-forces with zero stick force. This could be catastrophic. Thus, Piper adds an anti-servo geared tab at the trailing edge that creates camber resulting in a non-zero moment. In other words, it resists or pushes back on pilot inputs. Obviously, too much resistance is also bad. Thus, the size and gearing of the tab are optimized to give the preferred amount of resistance. For a given shape, the value of the resultant force and moment are functions of many things. Angle of attack, viscosity, speed of sound, density, velocity, wing area, etc. Therefore, when comparing airfoil performance, the actual values of lift, drag, and moments are meaningless without specifying all these parameters. For example, one might generate twice the lift of another wing, but it may do so very ineffectively and is actually three times the size. It is impossible to do a meaningful comparison of the wings in this way. So 
dimensionless aerodynamic coefficients are used to describe aerodynamic forces on a body. Their definition and significance stem from a principle called dynamic similarity. Consider two different flows over two different bodies. By definition, different flows are dynamically similar if 1. The geometric similarities exist, the bodies look alike or they're scaled models, and 2. The similarity parameters are the same. So, the key is to determine the governing similarity parameters. Dimensional analysis, for example, the Buckingham Pi theorem, provides a mechanism to do, to do this. By applying dimensional analysis, the following force and moment coefficients are defined. CL is the lift coefficient, CD is the drag coefficient, and CM is the moment coefficient. Q infinity is the free stream dynamic pressure, B is the wingspan or distance between the wingtips, wing area S is the projected shadow of the wing translated through the fuselage. This is another point of confusion for many students. The wing area could be interpreted as the combined area of the top and bottom surface of the main wing, or it could neglect the fuselage portion. These equations assume it's just the projected shadow of the wing translated through the fuselage. Another point of confusion is the cord length, C. For tapered wings, the cord length varies along the span. These equations assume an average cord, le cord length Wing area, average cord length, and wingspan are related by the equation S equals B times C. When collecting airfoil data, the wingspan is the width of the wind tunnel's test section. The wing spans from wall to wall. This width could be several length units, or it could be one length unit. In theory, the resultant forces and moments should scale with the width of the test section. Thus, 2D airfoil coefficients are given per unit span. Also, lowercase subscripts are used to, to denote 2D airfoil data. 3D wing or whole aircraft will use uppercase subscripts. While the actual lift, drag, and moments are functions of many variables, these coefficients, regardless of, of which form, are only a function of three similarity parameters, Reynolds number, Mach number, and angle of attack. Therefore, if a scale model is placed in a wind tunnel and the Reynolds number, Mach number, and angle of attack are equal to those of a flight test, these aerodynamic coefficients, lift, drag, and moment, will be the same for the two cases. This is a very powerful result. We have reduced the number of variables to only three. So we can now compare aerodynamic bodies without regard for size or free stream flight conditions. Next, we'll explore how these coefficients vary with angle of attack, Reynolds number, and Mach number. The plot of CL versus alpha, or angle of attack, is one of the classics of aerodynamics. A few key points about the lift curve are, first, there will be some angle of attack where the lift coefficient is zero. This is called the zero lift angle of attack, or alpha sub L equals zero. For a positively cambered airfoil, alpha zero lift is negative as shown above. The airfoil would have to fly at a negative angle of attack to generate zero lift. For a symmetric airfoil, the zero lift angle of attack is zero. It generates zero lift at zero degrees angle of attack. Second, the lift curve slope, denoted by CL alpha, is typically linear below stall. Its slope for all thin airfoils, believe it or not, it's, it's, it's a constant number and it's 0 0.11 per degree or 2 pi per radian. This can be proven theoretically using thin airfoil theory and is a very significant result. Third, just prior to stall, the airfoil reaches a maximum lift coefficient, and this is denoted by CL max. Fourth, 
the corresponding angle of attack at maximum lift is alpha stall. The airfoil is stalled due to separation at this point. An increase in angle of attack after this point causes a decrease in lift. Note that after stall, lift is not necessarily zero, it's just reduced. Prior to stall, lift coefficient and angle of attack are linearly related. Therefore, a plot of drag coefficient versus angle of attack will look just like a plot of drag coefficient versus lift coefficient. They will differ only by a constant. CD is the airfoil's profile drag coefficient. It includes skin friction and pressure drag. Like the lift curve, it's critical to understand what the drag polar is saying. Here's a few key points. When CD is plotted against CL, the graph is parabolic in nature. As lift, or angle of attack, increases, drag increases parabolically. This is why the drag curve is often called the drag polar. To understand why this occurs, consider that the oncoming flow sees as the angle of attack changes. First, drag is a minimum at the small angles of attack. Here, the oncoming flow sees a slender, streamlined body. Skin friction dominates and there is very little pressure drag. Next, the drag reaches a maximum at the large angle of attack. The oncoming flow no longer sees the airfoil as slender, it's now a blunt body. Skin friction drag is still present, but pressure drag dominates and becomes increasingly important. Recall that Reynolds number represents physically the ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. A flow with a high Reynolds number means the fluid elements in the flow have a lot of momentum. This means they are better able to overcome adverse pressure gradients. This means separation happens later and the airfoil stalls at a higher angle of attack. At low angles of attack, since the flow is not separated to begin with, a higher Reynolds number has no effect on the lift coefficient. The effect of Reynolds number on the skin friction drag is very small. A higher Reynolds number means higher velocity gradients near the wall. Therefore, the skin friction drag will be a little higher. This effect is small and is barely noticeable on drag curves. However, the effect of Reynolds number on the pressure drag is significant. A flow with a high Reynolds number means the fluid elements in the flow have more momentum. This means they are better able to overcome adverse pressure gradients. This means separation happens later. At low angles of attack, since the flow is not separated to begin with, a higher Reynolds number has little effect on pressure drag. However, at higher angle of attacks, the higher Reynolds number delays separation and therefore reduces the pressure drag. The result is the drag polar flattens. Unfortunately, in spite of very encouraging wind tunnel results, which yield laminar flow drag polars, significant drag reduction in flight has not been realized. Laminar flow cannot be maintained for any significant distance along either a fuselage or a wing surface, and the drag bucket does not appear on drag polars derived from flight test data. Laminar flow airfoils are historically interesting and are widely discussed in the academic literature, but to date, results of their use have been disappointing from a practical point of view. The icing boots, bug splats, paint chips, rivets, etc. all affect the smoothness of the surface. Increasing camber shifts the lift curve upward and to the left. There is no change in the lift curve slope. Remember CL alpha is always around 0.11 per degree alpha for all thin airfoils. Symmetric airfoil curves pass through the origin. Positively cambered airfoils have negative zero lift angles of attack. An airfoil with more camber will produce more lift at a given alpha before stall. An airfoil with more camber has a slightly higher CL max and a lower alpha stall. By definition, the pitching moment about the aerodynamic center 
is constant with alpha. So this curve is very simple. The moment coefficient about the aerodynamic center is basically insensitive to changes in Reynolds number or alpha. The values of the moment coefficients are negative for a positively cambered airfoil. This implies the airfoil is tending to pitch downward. In stability control, this has important ramifications. Symmetric airfoils have zero pitching moment coefficients about the aerodynamic center. And remember, the aerodynamic center is roughly at the quarter chord location in subsonic flow. Let's now walk through a typical NACA chart. The airfoil shape will be plotted on an XY grid at the top of the chart as shown in the red box. A legend for the data points in terms of Reynolds number is shown in the purple box. Note that two of the Reynolds numbers are the same. Data for the first three Reynolds numbers were recorded using a smooth airfoil. The triangle points repeated of the second Reynolds number were data recorded using a non-smooth airfoil with quote, standard roughness, unquote. NACA defines standard roughness as 0.011 inch grains of silicon carbide, also known as carborundum, applied to the surface at the leading edge over a surface length of 0.08 times the cord measured from the leading edge on both surfaces. The grains were thinly spread to cover 5 to 10 percent of the area. That's what standard roughness is. The location of the aerodynamic center for each Reynolds number is shown in the green box. As you can see, these values are close to the quarter cord rule of thumb for subsonic flow. The sectional lift coefficients are found using the information in the light blue boxes. Angle of attack is on the x-axis and sectional lift coefficient is on the y-axis, the inner number. The applicable curves are the ones with the 0.11 per degree alpha slopes, not the relatively flat curves. As an aerospace or flight test engineer, you should have a ballpark idea what a typical maximum lift coefficient and associated alpha stall are. If someone claims they have a sectional lift coefficient of eight and an alpha stall of 45 degrees, check their work. Notice the effect of surface roughness on lift. At low angles of attack, there's not much effect. However, maximum lift coefficient and the associated alpha stall are substantially lower for the rough surface. Information on pitching moment coefficient at the quarter chord point is found in the dark green boxes. Again, we assume the aerodynamic center is near the quarter chord. Note, the plots on the left side of the chart have angle of attack on the x-axis. Next, we'll move to the right side where sectional low lift coefficient is on the x-axis. Remember prior to stall, lift coefficient and angle of attack are linearly related. Therefore, plotting something versus angle of attack will look just like the plot versus lift coefficient. They will only differ by a constant. Recall the aerodynamic center is where the moment about that point is independent of angle of attack. We see that this is indeed the case looking at the information in the orange boxes. Finally, the sectional drag coefficients are found using the information in the blue boxes. Again, sectional lift coefficient is on the x-axis and sectional drag coefficient is on the y-axis. If you need an angle of attack value for a given sectional drag coefficient, use the associated sectional lift coefficient to find the angle of attack on the left plot. For example, a 0.8 sectional lift coefficient is about six degrees angle of attack for the smooth airfoils anyway. Notice the effect of surface roughness on drag is substantial. Basically, it's double.
In this module, we looked at airfoils. They have no wingtips or engines or fuselage mounting intersections. They are simply a two-dimensional wing section. Flow is assumed to vary only with the X and Y directions. Airfoils are called 2D or infinite wings because the aerodynamic properties don't change along the wingspan as they would for a three-dimensional finite wing. NACA produced lots of wind tunnel data for many, many airfoils in its 50-year history. And many of the NACA airfoils are still used throughout the aerospace industry today.